So the next speaker is going to be Caroline, and she's going to talk about deploying a robust active reference elicitation offering. So thanks everyone for talking it out and being here on the last day of the conference. You know, as a student, when you see your talks on the last day, you always get a little nervous, but I appreciate seeing everyone here. So I'm a PhD student at USC, University of Southern California, and today I'm talking about deploying a robust active preference solicitation algorithm on Enter, experiment design, interface, and evaluation for COVID-19 patient participation. And yes, I think I won for the longest title uh, this year, but this is joint work with my co-authors listed here from how we grateful for their assistance. So we're in preference uh, session, right? We've heard a lot about preference solicitation this week, even and how it incorporates into participatory design methods. Um, but its origins actually was in marketing, right? Maybe I'm surprising. If I want to sell you a car, right? I want to learn what your preferences are and the features of the car so I can sell you a car that you're going to like. But preference solicitation in general is really difficult to do, right? If I'm a little thinking emoji, I can probably tell you whether I like a blue car better than a red car. But if you think about the number of customizable features on our car, right, this slowly explodes and to figure out individuals' preferences over such a large feature space, that becomes really difficult. Real people, of course, can be very fickle, right? Today I like a red car, tomorrow I'm thinking blue, right? So it really just depends on, you know, we're at the whims of people, but we still want to figure out what their preferences are. And so within about the past 20 years or so, there's been a large effort using AI or optimization methods to better do and better discipline uh, preference solicitation. So one such method is that by Bionis et al. Uh, it's a robust active preference solicitation method that uses a methodology from robust optimization to do preference solicitation. So they're able to ask a moderate and of queries that will essentially learn individual preferences for policies or sort of any sort of general type of item. And we can see an example of uh, pictorially how this works, where at each stage of the online algorithm, it will decide a query to ask an individual about their preferences. Then the individual will give their response, and then it will use that algorithm, or excuse me, use that within the procedure to then ask the next question. And then essentially, it will recommend a policy at the, at the very end that will maximize the worst case utility of that individual. And so this method is super effective. Um, it has a lot of great qualities because of the robust optimization that's being used. Um, I'm really glad to get up, and it's not just because it's my advisor's work, but it actually outperforms various primary solicitation methods from the literature, so it's it's shown to work very well. Uh, however, with this paper, they only test in simulation, right? And I've talked a lot about, you know, real people are very fickle, right? It's hard to sort of model their behavior in reality. So just to step through some of the assumptions that this paper makes in their work, they assume that utility is linear and positive features, right? This is a huge kind of philosophical debate that we could have right on whether utility is actually linear or if it follows, you know, any other sort of functional form. When I'm being fickle, right, in this work, they assume that the fickleness follows a normal distribution, right? May or may not be true, but we're, we're all guilty, right, in this room of making these sort of assumptions so that we can do our, our nice work that we don't love. And then finally, uh, in this work, they assume that uncertainty and utility can be represented as a non-empty and boundary quality truth. So again, these are kind of standard modeling uh, assumptions that one makes, but you know, there's this big question of when actually deploying such an algorithm on real people, does it work well you know, outside of simulation, but in the real world? So again, I stress that this algorithm was developed in a previous work, and this work that I'm going to talk to you more about in detail is about actually bringing this algorithm to real people on Amazon you know, Turk and designing an experimental procedure on how you actually do evaluate whether this uh, algorithm works or not. So our contributions, more specifically, we design a preference solicitation platform and deploy it on Amazon Mechanical Turk, where it implements this robust active preference solicitation procedure. And specifically, we're going to be asking Turkers about their preferences for COVID-19 patient prioritization policies. And this uh, will be using real data from the UK. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about what those policies look like later. And then, you know, at the, the risk of, of spoiling the punchline, we do show that the method is more likely to recommend a policy that more aligns with individuals' preferences compared to just asking random figures. So to talk specifically about the model for preference solicitation, we're going to be using pairwise comparisons. You can see an example of that up in the top right, where there's two different policies that allocate ventilators to COVID-19 patients. And we can see there's different metrics for these policies. So for example, your chance of receiving a ventilator across age groups or the number of light years saved by that policy. 
So right here, email, we love our you know equity, fairness, efficiency trade-off, right? So for example, I may like a really efficient policy. So I would prefer the policy on the left, right? That saves many life years. But you know, another person we may really care about fairness. So we may prefer the policy on the right, you know, that more equally allocates ventilators across the age groups. So again, we're not sort of imposing any judgment on what is the right preference to have. People have preferences, right? We just want to figure out what those preferences are. But in any case, uh, whenever someone is presented with this pairwise comparison, they can say that they either prefer policy A, they're indifferent between the two, or that they prefer policy B. And so in this, uh, the robust optimization algorithm, the decision that's being made is which policy should appear as A and B so that we can strategically learn these preferences, right? So we can have sort of a bag of policies, and I want to pick the two that will show up in that pairwise comparison. So I know it's the last day of conference, uh, it's before lunch, but I will do my best to sort of walk through at a high level what the robust optimization algorithm looks like. And I understand that many of us are probably not robust optimization people, so I'll do this at a very high level. So in blue are the decisions that we get to make as the decision maker, and in red are the adversarial or the decisions that nature makes against us. So as I explained before, the first thing we get to do is optimize the query, right? So again, we're taking that policy A and B that we will learn the most about individual's preferences with respect to. And we do this with respect to the worst case response that an individual could give. So no matter whether they say that they prefer A or B or they're indifferent, we want to head against that uncertainty as we do in robust optimization. And so then we'll recommend them that optimal policy, this policy X, such that it will maximize their worst case utility. And and uh, again, in the sphere of robust optimization, this calligraphic U is our uncertainty set, which is basically just our prior on what we think the individual's utility is based on what they've already seen in the queries and what they've already responded. So again, it's just, you know, what's our current state of our idea of what their utilities are. So again, to kind of summarize, we get to select what those queries look like, such that no matter what they tell us about their preferences, we can recommend a policy to that individual that will maximize their worst case utility. So again, this is the, the previous work, works really well in simulation, and this work is all about validating it with real people, real preferences, or maybe we don't fit nicely into these assumptions that are kind of going on behind. So to talk specifically about our experimental design for actually evaluating this. So our little stick figure here on the left, that's our charger, and with a, a, a flip of a coin, they either are sorted into the top stream of this flow chart or the bottom stream. So, for example, let's say they go to the top, where their first answer K queries selected by the robust procedure that the finance at all, and then they do a memory bite, which is just basically having them do some unrelated tasks, something to get their mind off preferences, right? It's kind of like our men in black procedure, where we erase their memories and make sure that they're, you know, not having any sort of bias between the two things, because the next thing we'll ask them to do is answer K queries that were selected random. So again, the memory right thing is just to kind of reset their brain and reduce uh, the effect of a carry order effect, for instance. So uh, let's imagine again they were sorted into the bottom stream, but then first they'll just answer the random queries first, do the memory right and profile. So this is all kind of doing our due diligence, right, making sure there's some bias between people that, for example, answer the robust queries versus the random. And then you, no matter which stream they're sorted into, the last query that our interpreter will see is again a pairwise comparison, but it's going to compare the policy that is optimal under the information collected by the robust uh, procedure, and then the policy that's optimal presented or as, as collected by the random procedure. So this um, in this last query, the interpreters will directly report which policy more aligns with their preferences. So essentially, right, which algorithm did a better job of figuring out. Right, what their two preferences are. So that will be the final theory. So, as a side note, uh, I want to point out that even for the random solicitation, we do make this recommendation in a robust way. So, it's more of an apples to apples comparison, just comparing the elicitation procedures. We're doing random elicitation, but the recommendation is actually similar. Okay, so now to talk specifically about uh, the policy that our servers will evaluate on. So, again, uh, we're focusing on a COVID-19 patient prioritization uh, setting where if you think back to the early pandemic, right, there were situations when there weren't, for example, enough ventilators to go around and doctors use what's called a triage policy. And this will sort patients into high priority to low priority for resources. And as resources become available, they're first go to those high priority and so on. And again, here at EMO, we are very familiar, right, with this whole fairness and efficiency trade-off. And, you know, we'll, individuals have different preferences for how such trade-off should be represented. And so here in our simulation, we'll actually focus on 
uh, policy that assign critical care beds to patients in the UK. And so what we did is we took 30 basically random decision trees uh, for policies that would allocate these resources to individuals that are based on a function of a patient's age group and how long they've waited. And then we simulated how they would, would perform it and implemented that hospital. And my apologies, this image is a little small here on the right, but this is actually a screenshot from the actual interface that we deployed. And so this is exactly what the end characters would see. And it's basically on the left is all of the outcomes for policy A, and the right, all the outcomes for policy B. So we have a fair comparison. And I'll walk us through it. So at the very top, it's showing the number of like you're saved by the policy. The pie chart is the portion of patients that survive. So these two right are efficiency metrics. And then below that, the proportion of patients that receive critical care by age group, and then the proportions of patients that survive by age group. So again, brain fairness as a potential factor in how people report their preferences. Okay. So again, we generate a bunch of random policies, simulate how they would perform if we were actually implement them in the hospital. And then this is the, what the truckers will report their preferences on are the outcomes of such policy. So we recruit 193 uh, turkers to take this experiment. This is uh, the number after we kind of filter people using, you know, the memory checking or excuse me, the attention checking and all the kind of utilities there. And they'll report their preferences over these great policies. So to jump into our results, first I'm showing uh, the diversity of the preferences uh, reported by our individuals. So this chart is showing the results of that last Paris comparison, where again, they're saying, do they prefer the policy recommended by robust or the policy recommended by random? And on the X axis, it's just uh, the index of the policy that they reported as the one that they did prefer. And on the Y axis, the number of users that did report that. So we can see there are some clusters of policies that you know many truckers do prefer, but overall there's a great variety, right? So this is just all kind of to show that you know it's worth coming up with you know a very you know mathematically perhaps intense formulation to figure out what people's preferences are, right? If there was one dominating policy that everyone liked, right, we could just always recommend that and not have to make this whole procedure and algorithm and all that kind of stuff. So this was just kind of a check to make sure that in this setting it does actually make sense to figure out people's individual preferences. And then to cut to the chase, uh, so this is actually showing the direct result of whether people preferred the policy recommended by robust or recommended by random. And on the right, it's saying whether people reported that they were indifferent to these policies. So it's very possible that the optimal policies, according to robust and random, are actually the same. And that's what I'm showing there in the red all the way on the right. Uh, so that means right, the algorithms learned the same information right, with respect to people's preferences. Or it could be very much the case that two different policies are recommended, but you know, based on an individual's utility, the policies right, are similar enough in how much someone likes them and they report that they're indifferent. So that's just kind of covering our bases there. And the thing right, we're most interested in is the performance of robust versus random. We can see here it's about 21% of our turkers actually do prefer the policy recommended by robust. It's a little close, but our 95% confidence intervals don't overlap, which is why we always love to see that uh, in research. And yeah, so basically, again, there's this previous uh, robust preference solicitation uh, method existing in the literature. It was shown really well to work in simulation, but makes a series of assumptions right, that are hard to verify if those assumptions actually hold. So kind of this big question of, of you know, should this, this method actually be used in reality? And we've shown you know, incrementally, you know, there's some debate, I think, about whether Turkers are I mean, they're real people, but right, are they, are they doing what we actually want them to do? But we're making this incremental progress of showing that, yes, this algorithm does actually perform well uh, when working with real people in real practices. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, um, so, one of the assumptions of the original policy is that the practices are linear and it can be gap features. Um, so, that makes a lot of sense in a situation like this where you more or less can't linearly be assigned things. But what about more um, sweet policies where you basically decide to do something or not do something, which is probably more complicated in your life? That assumption seems like it would be a lot weaker there. So, did you have any ideas? Did you like teach it? Did you think about that? Yeah, should I think we might do that? So that, that's a very good point, and I guess the right thing to say is that I don't, I don't quite know, and I would, you know, that that probably is not a good, good setting to use this algorithm. In. So I think uh, because of the assumptions, right, there are there are settings where it works really well, where we, you know, we're, we're evaluating policies that are essentially vectors of real value attributes, right? And so that makes sense. 
Um, and then other settings, you know, for example, looking at outputs of large language models, which is a huge thing, right, for integrating people's preferences, right? This algorithm, you know, probably doesn't make much sense there. So I think um, short answer is that it probably wouldn't work, or we would need to do a lot of, you know, data finagling to sort of fit it into this metric for this algorithm. And then it becomes the point of, you know, are the preference, the human preferences getting lost in translation? So that was that. Short answer, probably not. We have to think really hard and may mess things up with problems. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.